The Erie's Indians, who were they? Where did they come from? How did they disappear? Hello and welcome to the Jefferson Educational Society's Digital Programming. I'm Ben Spagan and I'm the Vice President at the Jefferson and I'm a contributing editor at the Erie Reader. And in this conversation, we'll work to answer those questions, examining the memories, the legends, the history and the context of the Erie's Indians. Now taking us on this deep dive into one of the most fascinating topics from the pages of Accidental Paradise, a 13,000 year history of Presque Isle is one of the book's co-authors, Dr. David Frew. Uh, 194 pages, full color, hard cover, dusk, jacket, and all. Accidental Paradise, the 13,000 year history of Presque Isle. The newly published book features Presque Isle's natural history, a colorful political history, including its creation as a state park in 1921, and plenty more. That's what we're going to take a look at in this series as we look at elements of the book and have them featured here in discussion. Uh, for more information on how, where, and uh, when to purchase the book, uh, published in partnership with the Tom Ridge Environmental Center Foundation, please do visit accidentalparadise.com. Uh, here in this Accidental Paradise digital programming series, we're going to focus our attention on one topic of the book, this time the Erie's Indians. Uh, a series of chance meetings plunged Dr. Frew into a long and complicated relationship with Indian history, and in particular with the Iroquoian culture, religion, and politics. His, as he puts it, near obsession has led him to audit graduate classes in anthropology, travel to Mayan ruins in Mexico and Central America, and meet with chiefs from the Six Nations Reservation in Brantford, Ontario. Now, a bit more about Dr. David Frew before we get started. He is, as I said, a scholar in residence at the JES. We're glad to have him on board to welcome him uh, as, as part of the JES family now. He's a retired professor, longtime professor, and administrator for Gannon University. He has written or co-written 40 books and more than 100 articles, cases, and papers. Uh, most recently, he's been authoring the prolific On the Waterfront series for the JES, which is available online at jeserie.org and can be sent right to your inboxes if you subscribe to our emails. For a fuller biography of Dr. David Frew, do visit that website, jeserie.org. Now, since this program is first airing live on the JES Facebook page, we're going to work our way through as many questions from you, the viewers, as we can as we host this event. If you have a question, just leave it in the comment section below. If you're watching or listening to a later broadcast of this event, uh, still feel free to send us your questions, your comments to keep this conversation going. And for more information about upcoming Jefferson Educational Society programs and publications, that website, once again, is jeserie.org. And be sure to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Dr. David Frew, thanks for coming in for this conversation. Thanks for having me. It's fun. So you have a wonderful PowerPoint, Dr. Frew. I'm going to pull this up right now so we can get started. We're going to work our way through that. And uh, we're, like I said, we're going to take some questions at the end. Uh, so that way we can uh, continue to talk about uh, this wonderful program. All right, Dr. Frew, over to you, the Erie's Indians. Let's talk about memories, legends, history, context as part of uh, this Accidental Paradise JES digital programming series. Well, let's start with what was going on in North America prior to the arrival of Columbus, the pre-Columbian Americas. And let me mention that, and I'm gonna roll through a lot of rough averages. No one knows the exact numbers here, but I'm just going to sort of take the take take the consensus. It, it looks like there were about 60 million Native American North Americans living in North America, not not Native North Americans, uh, you know, living here before Columbus came. Of those 60 million, 80 percent were living below the Rio Grande River. Uh, which is sort of interesting to think about. They were the ones that had been here the longest and were the most established. In fact, uh, the Mayan cultures were beginning to actually write, which uh, makes it seem like they were uh, fairly well advanced. Amongst all those people, there were some who were, uh, would be characterized by anthropologists as agrarian. They had been where they were for a long, long time and uh, they were growing their own food and they'd established a sort of an agrarian rather than a, uh, uh, rather than a hunter-gatherer culture. The others, and mostly we're talking about the, uh, the, the Native Americans that were around this area, in particular, the Iroquois and the Eries, and they were different. 
uh, were hunter gatherers. In fact, what's maybe different about the Eries and the Iroquois is it looks like the uh, uh, Iroquois were hunter gatherers and the Eries uh, might possibly have been uh, recent agrarian people that moved this way. And, and Dr. Fur, I think that's one of the most important things uh, that to me to reflect on is, is the difference between the tribes and the cultures. I think sometimes uh, when we're thinking of, um, you know, back to our early classroom history, we tend to think of Native Americans or uh, First Peoples as one big bucket. And, and really it's a much more complex uh, grouping of people than perhaps we think on at first blush. That's exactly correct, Ben. There was more differences between them than there were uh, within them, that's for sure. And, and take and, us over to the origins and the land bridge. How, how do we get here? How do they get here? How do the native people uh, end up on the North American and in the South American continents? Well, accepting for a strange and sometimes crazy theories like they came from outer space uh, and were planted here, or maybe some stuff that's maybe a little bit more credible, like paddled over here from Hawaii and, and they landed in South America or wherever. Uh, the, the consensus of thought is that they came over the land bridge uh, during the times when the glaciers uh, were active. And uh, some of them uh, went uh, immediately south because they were looking for a better climate and for food. Uh, that's represented by the blue line here, might have followed the coast. Some of them might have used boats of some sort to get south. And others wound their way down the middle of the country. And of those, uh, a small segment, uh, a relatively small segment, uh, crossed North America and uh, landed somewhere near us. That would that would be the Iroquois. And, and like you said on the previous slide, the, the majority are living uh, around or south of the Rio Grande. So we're not seeing a heavy concentration of the population here in the north. That's correct. 20%. So most of us uh, tend to think of the year when we think of the American history, uh, we certainly think of 1492, the arrival of Columbus. So who's coming, when, and what are they looking for? Well, 1492 is when Columbus came, and that's uh, generally imagined uh, in our history books, in our old history books, to be uh, the, uh, the beginning of European arrival here. In actual fact, we know that the Norwegians were here years and years and years before Columbus. And we also know that the Chinese were here possibly a hundred years before Columbus. There's a couple of nice books about that. They didn't care to gather land. Uh, they came and they, they left and they went back. Amongst the Europeans that were here and uh, active on our part of the country were the Spanish who started out a little south of us. St. Augustine is a place where we think of them. And they were primarily chasing gold. Uh, they continued... Uh, they continued down south uh, and they had little, little or no impact up here in the north. The Europeans that we are imagining uh, were the French, the English, the Swedish and the Dutch. And uh, the thing that made the French uh, people here uniquely different from the English and the Swedish and the Dutch was, while they were all looking for land and, and the resources of North America, the French had a special interest in saving souls. So uh, every one of the French expeditions, with a few exceptions, was either sponsored or accompanied by uh, Catholic missionaries, notably uh, the Jesuits, and uh, their, their idea here was to save souls. Yeah, and I think that just pops right off the slide to me of, of a key difference. Uh, number one, the Spanish just looking for gold, but uh, the French looking for not just land and furs or, or resources like the British are looking. And I'm sure we're going to get into that a little bit more as we continue on. But let's talk about the ethno ethnocentrism. Um, why don't we know as much as we want to or we could uh, about Native Americans and Indians? Well, there's loads of individual reasons, but the overriding reason is ethnocentrism, not understanding that other people, while they're different from you, uh, might be smart, intelligent, bright uh, people that would have something to teach you. So if we'll start with Columbus and take a look at uh, the modern analysis of his impact, Columbus is uh, 30 years in the, uh, in the Caribbean, resulted in a shift in population from 8 million to 25,000 Caribbean Indians. That's just astonishing. And that happened for a variety of reasons, not the least of which is that the uh, Indians 
had no resistance to European diseases. So Columbus was taking terrible advantage and enslaving them, uh, treating them worse than you would treat animals. And uh, in the midst of the interactions, they were getting sick. And one of the things that took them to the ground was smallpox. In addition, uh, measles, chickenpox, and the common cold, they had no defenses against those things. Another thing that happened was that the, uh, the, the uh, Europeans that came here didn't understand a couple of things about Indian culture, which were sort of characteristic across the tribes. First of all, the Indians used storytelling to record history. It was only the Mayans way south of here were starting to write, starting to record things in hieroglyphics forms. All the other Indians used storytelling and they were incredibly uh, focused on keeping accurate records of their histories. And the way he did that by assigning the, the women of the culture uh, in Indian cultures were matriarchal, they were maternal, and the job of the elder women who were actually in charge were to be the keepers of the stories. So the Indian women in the longhouses in Iroquois culture taught the origin stories and all the other stories of the uh, history of the Iroquois, and as far as they knew all other Indians, to the youngsters, the children, and particularly to the, to the female children, who had to carry on that tradition. The structures here were not political, they were familial. That seemed completely unusual and odd to the Europeans when they came here. So they paid attention to the men, but not the women. They failed to try to figure out what the stories were. They looked down on the Indians because they didn't have writing. But what we know now is that they had a cosmology and a powerful cosmology of their own. It was non-Christian, so it was it was uh, hard for them to understand, but the, uh, the Jesuits uh, caught on to that, that non-Christian cosmology and they were immediately excited by the fact that there was a co cosmology. The other thing I've noted is that we now know that Europeans were totally unable to discriminate between tribal languages. So if they heard a Iroquois speak versus an Erie's Indian speak versus a Susquehannock Indian speak, uh, or a Huron Indian speak. The languages were different, but they couldn't discern between the differences. Was there any attempt uh, by the Europeans to try to work through understanding the languages or understanding the cultures, or did they just simply view the, the natives as primitive and uh, there, there was no desire to work to understand these other cultures? The only, the only people that were, uh, that were here in the early days making some sort of an attempt to try to figure this out were the Jesuits. And they reported that that's a written history that we can find in a uh, newsletter called the Jesuit Relations, uh, which is available if somebody is crazy as I am, you can go find those and read them. I'm waiting for a slide to change. <laughs> there we go. I apologize about that, Dr. Fru. Uh, my mouse got a little hung up there. So tell us about the, the Iroquois and, and the five and then six nations. Um, let's start to, to unpack that. The Iroquois were, uh, were, were organized. They had a thing a little, bit like, a little bit like our constitution called the Rules of Confederacy. In fact, my first attraction to uh, the Iroquois was I was in Brantford with friends. I uh, have sailing friends that are there. And uh, I was listening on CBC radio, this would have been you know, 25 or 30 years ago, to Chief Jake Thomas read the rules of Confederacy in native Iroquois. And while he was doing that, they were being translated in English. And I thought that was so incredible that I drove over uh, to the uh, reservation and listened to him for a while. Uh, should mention that there were originally five tribes in the Six Nations, the Mohawk, Onondaga, Oneata, Cayuga, and Seneca. We're most familiar with the Seneca because they were the Western gatekeepers of, of the Iroquois Confederacy. Uh, the territory of the Iroquois was roughly from the Hudson River to the Mississippi and uh, from the Great Lakes to the Mason-Dixon line uh, before, of course, that was identified that way. An interesting cosmology, uh, and this raises the question, some have argued that this might be an argument, the Freudian argument for, uh, or a Jungian argument, if you prefer that, uh, for something that's inside all of us. 
they have in their cosmology a virgin birth. And the product of a virgin birth uh, was the great peacemaker who organized the five nations and tried to help them to understand the great law of peace, which became the rules of confederacy. And he was introduced to the chiefs, the five chiefs by the John the Baptist figure. And we've all heard this, this name before, Hiawatha. That was the role of Hiawatha. He was a uh, Iroquois. Uh, they had an origin story, of course, that we didn't learn until much later because we didn't talk to the women about the origin stories. We mostly thought we should talk to the men. And the origin stories uh, had us uh, believing that the Iroquois originally came from Montreal and they came this way down the St. Lawrence River looking for more land and for uh, fertile areas uh, to farm and to hunt and to fish. And uh, one thing that went on in those old days and continues into modern times because of my uh, connection to uh, Warren, Pennsylvania and Frewsburg, those are places where my family came from. I was actually able to go to one or two of these as a kid, not that I understood that it was happening, but before the Kinzu Dam was flooded, uh, that was one of the locations of the annual Indian games. And by the way, if you're watching the Olympics and wonder who are these native North Americans, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a player in the Olympics called North America. That's the, uh, the Indians that are still participating in those Indian games. And one of the greatest of the games is lacrosse. And, and Dr. Furr, I, I, I've got to, I know we just talked about it, but I'll bring it back again. But wouldn't, wouldn't we think that sharing some cosmology, a, a virgin birth story, that when Europeans learn this, this might in some way influence their perception or thinking about these native cultures, that they share some sort of commonality? Did this not strike them? Did they just not get the story? Was it not, was it something they weren't paying attention to? I, I can't help but think you, you mentioned the Jungian or, or, or Freudian notion here that this connects us on a deeper level. This just didn't do it for the Europeans. Well, uh, the French who were the companions of the Jesuits uh, were generally annoyed by the Jesuits holding them back. The, the, the French were, they were frantically trying to control Montreal, which was their headquarters to uh, New Orleans where they were already well established. And they were trying to, to pin the English on the Atlantic coast and keep them come from coming down the Ohio Valley or the Ohio River. Uh, so they were constantly trying to move forward while the, uh, while the Jesuits were holding them back. And one of the things that Jesuits did is they started sending uh, fundraising newsletters back to France. So most of this stuff uh, you'll find in those newsletters uh, the French explorers that are so well known, uh, they didn't care so much about this as the Jesuits did. They were trying to uh, make money. So let's take us on to the Beaver Wars and see how the French, British, and Swedish, and, and Dutch opportunism is having an impact on Native cultures. Well, uh, while the uh, Spanish were intent on bringing back gold in ships and it was heavy and it put them at risk, they lost a few of those ships because of overloading. Uh, the uh, rest of the Europeans were more focused on scoring beavers and what you could do with a beaver. In fact, all kinds of furs, every, every kind of fur that they could catch and, and tan went back to Europe and it was in high, high, high demand. By this time, uh, Europe had been denuded. There were no, no significant forests. You couldn't find uh, animals to make into furs. The, simple, the single most popular fur from the, uh, from the new world was the beaver because you could make it very easily into a beaver hat. Everyone wanted to have a beaver hat, uh, Europeans and French and, and Swedish and Dutch people. And notice that those are all the cold climates. The Spanish weren't so interested in beaver hats. If you've been to Spain or Portugal, you'd probably understand why they could care less about beaver hats. So in their enthusiasm to gather beavers, uh, the French, the British, the Swedish and the Dutch, uh, they started arming uh, and or trading with or both uh, tribes like the Iroquois. And uh, the Iroquois learned quickly uh, that they could make a whole lot of money uh, by trading beaver. At first, what the Iroquois did, uh, they went to their cousin tribes, the lesser tribes, and they would 
pay them with trinkets. And then finally, it, it occurred to them, why are we bothering to do this? We'll just take the guns that we have. We don't want to give them to the lesser tribes. They could turn them on us, and we don't like each other that much. And we'll uh, get rid of the lesser tribes, and we'll get the beavers ourselves. There was so much in such rampant beaver hunting without thinking about conservation that they actually destabilized the population. The uh, Swedish were trading with the Susquehannock. Those were the Indians that lived along the Susquehanna River in, in Pennsylvania, stretched probably from roughly today's Philadelphia to today's Harrisburg. Uh, the French were trading directly with the Huron, that would be north of Lake Erie. The Dutch, as in the Holland Land Company, uh, and the British, uh, they were working primarily with the Iroquois. And it's that reminder that the Spanish are rather single-minded or singularly focused, that they're just after the gold. Just after the gold, and they took the worst toll on the Indians. At least, uh, not, not that this is the best thing we could say about them, the French, the British, the Swedish, and the Dutch realized that if you're going to take advantage of the Indians, you can't kill them all right away. So the Indians in the north uh, suffered mightily uh, from uh, the problems of, of interactions with the British, smallpox, measles, common colds, chickenpox, etc., but not as badly as the Indians that came into contact with the Spanish. And let, let, let's focus again on the north here. And uh, here you have an image that, that shows Indian trade routes. And this is just the state of Pennsylvania. Walk us through this sophisticated infrastructure. If you were to take a look at a map of Indian trade routes stretching from the Hudson Bay to New Orleans, mostly in the east, we didn't have this kind of network in the West. Distances were too large. Uh, it would have looked like a Rand McNally roadmap. And to make a sort of an interesting uh, uh, parallel, if we'd imagine the interstate system with the, the major highways like I-90, I-80, I-79, and the secondary roads like Route 10 or Route, you know, no, not 10, Route 5, Route 20, et cetera, uh, the way the Indians seemed to develop a system like that is they used rivers to help them to understand how to create trails, and the larger rivers were the major ones. So the two dark lines you see there on the right-hand side would be the Susquehanna River, which is an extraordinarily long river, maybe the fourth largest river in North America. And uh, the dark one that seems to disappear as it goes to the north is the Delaware. And both the Susquehanna and the Delaware cut through the Allegheny upland. So uh, those of you that like to go out into the middle of the lake and look back toward Erie and say that high ridge that we've all, st all started calling the Appalachian Escarpment, now that's the northern edge of a giant tr troublesome landmass uh, that stretches from roughly uh, Montreal to Georgia and gets wider as it goes south and gets further away from the coast. And if you landed and or were an Indian and you were trying to trade on the Atlantic coast, you had to figure out a way to get through that. And the smart way to get through that, the smart way to create any, any path was to follow the water because the water had already done it. So the Delaware water gap is the way the Indians used to come through uh, the, the upland following the Delaware River. And if you've driven that, which I'm sure lots of us have, you've noticed that I-80 goes rushing through that. That's the part of the path that the Indians walked on. And right next to it is the Delaware River, which is why they call it the Delaware Water Gap. And so what you see here is trade routes that all the tribes used. The Iroquois were to the north of this. The Susquehannock uh, were down around that Susquehanna River area. And there was a dozen minor tribes throughout Pennsylvania as well. And I guess you could characterize the Eries as being a minor tribe as well. And we're going to get to them in a minute. And, and right before we do get to the, them, Dr. Fru, uh, going back to how diverse the tribes are, uh, multilingual, when you said Rand McNally, I immediately thought of the map that I've got in my car and uh, you know where I picked it up and how I've seen countless maps at countless gas stations or convenience stores. 
how widely spread uh, or universal were these maps amongst tribes to understand and be able to communicate with each other and share these roadways, so to speak, these waterways, these, these transportation networks? How, how widespread was this amongst the tribes? Well, probably not at all. This is probably more like the game of pass the message along at a party. Uh, the Iroquois knew uh, the trails well because they were trading all the way to New Orleans. That's our Iroquois, They're the ones that stretched along uh, the Great Lakes. Uh, but the smaller tribes like the Eries, they probably didn't get further than trading. The Eries trade, their biggest trading partner was the Susquehannock. And I'm sure the Susquehannock knew the next tribe, etc. So not all the tribes would have had a, a global understanding of that map. So before I interrupted you, you said you were going to tell us about the Erie's Indians. Let's get into that. 20,000 people, plus or minus a few, and they lived on the shore of Lake Erie. They did not live on the peninsula. They were afraid of the water. They did not use canoes. They used, once in a while, uh, dugout canoes. They didn't use the traditional birch bark canoe that we imagine, uh, and they used rafts. Uh, they probably had about 50 stockaded villages and they stretched from Dunkirk to Ashtabula. East of Dunkirk were an, another tribe called the Wenro. And west of Ashtabula, we start with all the various Ohio tribes uh, that fought uh, against Mad Anthony Wayne. They did not use longhouses, making them significantly different from the Iroquois. Uh, their particular way of making a living was they had perfected a poison, a toxin, which they used for fishing. So in the spring and the fall, they went to sheltered areas where they knew their, the, 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 the water was teeming with fish. Uh, they threw the poison in the water, the fish bobbed to the surface, they grabbed the fish, and when they processed the fish to eat, they somehow knew how to get the poison out of it so that the fish were safe to eat. Uh, more interestingly, they used the poison uh, to put on the tips of arrows so that they were a ferocious uh, tribe defensively. We know that they were taller and much heavier than the Iroquois. They didn't like the Iroquois and the Iroquois did not like them. We know that they were perennial winners of the Iroquois games, those games that I saw when I was a kid at the Kinzu area. And the reason they won is because they were so big. It's like having an NFL football team, you know, playing a college football team from a division two school. Their language was significantly different from Iroquois, uh, but we've only now started to learn that. And they had an origin story just like the Iroquois. The Iroquois said and thought that they came from the north. They came from the Montreal area and came along the St. Lawrence River. The Erie's, the Erie's origin story was that they came up a long river valley from way south of the Great Lakes from the descriptions the best thinking is that they came up the Mississippi, and uh, now that we know that they were so big, we're thinking maybe they were the descendants of an agrarian population that got overcrowded, and they came this way from maybe as far south as Mexico. And, and what, what was attractive about uh, this area of, of why they would stop here, why they wouldn't push on? What made sense to say, we're going to settle in this area? Well, for, first of all, it's as far as you could go. And uh, they were fishermen. We knew that from their very beginning. Uh, and why fish in a river, which is 12 feet wide, when you find yourself at the edge of a lake? And of course, the I I Iroquois, all the Indians knew way more about the geography uh, than we would have guessed. So they knew that the lakes were there, they knew how big the lakes were, and they knew that the lakes were teeming with fish. So the Eries could catch enough fish during the spring catch uh, to feed themselves uh, for all year. And then they'd go out for the fall catch and catch enough to uh, put away and, and live happily uh, during uh, the uh, winter months. So that made them, even though they were transported here by hunting and gathering and moving, uh, that made them an agrarian culture as opposed to the Iroquois. They were just starting to be agrarian. The and, Iroquois. And 
and, and not only perfecting the poison or toxin for fishing, but perfecting the ability to know how much to treat the fish afterwards so they can be safely consumed. Tell us a bit, Dr. Fru, about the Erie's trading partners. Once they uh, settle in the region, uh, other tribes they're working with, uh, what does that look like? Well, these essentially traded with the uh, Indians that lived around the lake. So if you could take a, 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 a helicopter view of the lake, uh, there were some important tribes on the other side. There was a tribe on the other side of the lake uh, growing and, and processing and, uh, and trading tobacco. They were called the neutrals or sometimes they were called the Adewandrans or even the tobacco Indians. And all Indians used tobacco in religious ceremonies uh, the way uh, we used wine. The Europeans used wine. So uh, Indians and Jake Thomas, the chief at Brantford once told me this, uh, he was lighting up a cigarette when we were talking and I was sort of aghast and he was laughing at me saying, uh, we uh, have a have a we, we we Indians have a weakness for alcohol because inter, it was introduced to us artificially by the Europeans. But you Europeans went crazy for tobacco, so we know how to use tobacco, and you know you use you know how to use alcohol, etc. Uh, but before I get stuck on that, uh, the Wenro that were just east of of uh, the. Uh, Erie's Indians, uh, they used to harvest flint and use it to make arrowheads. So why would you make your own arrowheads when you didn't have access to flint, like the Erie's didn't? You would trade fish. And the neutral Indians uh, would trade tobacco for, for, uh, for uh, uh, arrowheads. And the Massas or Mississauga, not Massasauga Indians that lived on the other side of the lake and toward Toronto, uh, they had cap. They had specialized the art of not not going out to hunt for deer, but to uh, corral and capture and herd them and keep them domestically. So they were smart enough to figure out that if you wanted to eat a deer during the winter, it'd be easier for you if you had like two hundred in a corral someplace. There's an interesting uh, uh, aside to that to the modern history of Presque Isle. When Presque Isle became a state park, uh, somebody did an analysis and asked what animals used to be here and why aren't they here anymore? And one that had been there but was gone was the white-tailed deer. So a decision was made to get some white-tailed deer live and to put them on Presque Isle. And where'd we get them? We went to the other side of Lake Erie. Uh, we bought 30 from an Indian tribe and we put them on a barge and brought them here and turned them loose on Presque Isle. And that's where our deer came from. One more interesting note, uh, the Susquehannock that lived around the Susquehanna River, which was the very favorite trading partner of the Erie's. They were large, like the Erie's. They had a similar origin story and their language was almost identical. Uh, so we have a suspicion that the Susquehannock came up here the same way that the Erie's did. And we see there the, the intersectionality of various tribes uh, working together and, and traveling at times some distance uh, to work with one another. Uh, tell us, uh, Dr. Fru, about the European-American wars and this impact on the tribes in the area. Well, the first European-American -Amer war of significance was the French and Indian War. And uh, some of the Indians got involved fighting with the French and uh, the Iroquois were supposed to remain neutral because of the work of the great peacemaker. Uh, they tried, but they didn't entirely remain neutral. And one of the most interesting th things from my perspective that demonstrates American ethnocentrism uh, was the work of Lord Jeffrey Amherst. Now, I have a daughter who was an all-state soccer player in Wisconsin, and she got an opportunity to go to Amherst, which is an extraordinarily uh, good school, very hard to get in, to play soccer. And uh, when she was there on her four year watch as a soccer player, all of the athletic teams got together and they dug in and they said they were not going to play. I forget what year it was, unless their nickname was changed from the Lord Jeffs to anything else because they were outraged by what Jeffrey Amherst had done. Jeffrey Amherst came here, Lord Jeffrey Amherst came here uh, to work with the British during the French and Indian War. And uh, he was famous for uh, being an incredibly smart 
and an aggressive military guy. Uh, but the most wild and crazy thing he did, he was helping to defend Fort Pitt toward the end of the French and Indian War against Pontiac and his troops. And uh, it was winter. And he and his, uh, his fellow officers went out of the fort with the white flag. Uh, Pontiac wasn't able to penetrate the fort, nor were the people in the fort uh, capable of going out and conquering the Indians. They came out with a flag of truce and they said, okay, it's winter, let's take a month off. And we've got a special gift for you. We're gonna give you these blankets so you can stay warm because we feel sorry for you. And where do they get the blankets? Well, they had a smallpox ward at the, at the fort because that was, a, it was an ongoing problem with all the Europeans. Uh, it was the very first example of biological warfare. Uh, the Indians cuddled up in these smallpox blankets. They all got sick, and by the spring, uh, they were dead and gone, and the uh, Jeffrey Amherst had won the day. The second war that uh, captured the attention of local Indians in particular was the War of Independence. And during the War of Independence, Chief Joseph Brandt who was uh, partially Indian and partially British and had been trained in a British school actually. Uh, he fought uh, and he was a fierce fighter because he was smart and brave and he understood British culture. He fought for England. Well, of course, when the war was over, he realized that he was on the wrong side of that war. And if he stayed in place on this side of Lake Erie, uh, he would have been persecuted. So he took, and this was an awful thing, and, it, and a good thing at the same time, uh, he took 2,000 Iroquois with him, uh, families, and they left. And he went across uh, at Niagara Falls, walked uh, with, his, with his group of 2,000 people to Brantford, Ontario. Uh, that's a little town, maybe 15 miles north of Port Dover. And he was awarded a huge pile of land there and also the opportunity to run the Ford that would be how you get across the Grand River uh, at what's now called Brantford. And uh, he made a huge living there and uh, did quite well. And uh, as, he was, as he was doing what he was doing on his side of the lake with 2,000 unified uh, Iroquois from various tribes, uh, most of them were the more Eastern tribes, not too many Seneca went with them, a new prophet, spiritual prophet by the name of Handsome Lake came uh, to the Iroquois and said, look, at, here's your original sin. Your original sin was forgetting what the great peacemaker taught you and fighting. You should have remained neutral. You made a mistake. Uh, now, for those of you that have an interest in the modern work that goes on at the Six Nations Reservation, and I've been there dozens of times, it's a great spot to do research. That's where Tonto was born, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the wonderful Native American partner of the Lone Ranger. If, if you're a fan of uh, uh, Dances with Wolves, uh, the guy who did, did the Indian parts of that and was the actor was Graham Greene, and you've seen him in dozens of films since then. You can Google him. He's a successful actor, but he still lives in Brantford. I've run into him twice in Port Dover eating ice cream cones on the pier. And at Brantford, what they've done that's kind of an interesting thing is they've decided to take responsibility for understanding the cousin tribes. That would be all the tribes that weren't part of the Six Nations, but then included tribes that had been displaced and had moved into this area, like the Nanticoke that lived just to the east of Port Dover, and the Eries, and the Susquehannock, etc. And in recent years, uh, when, when they were watching, when the, when the people at the Six Nations Reservation, watching what was happening at, uh, at Nanticoke, Ontario, just across the lake, where the, the world's largest uh, coal-fired power plant was operating for years and years and years. By the way, it became the second largest one when China opened up a slightly larger one in the Three Gorges project. Uh, they decided to shut that down. And the Nanticoke Indians uh, came up with a uh, proposal. They went to Ontario Hydro and said, how would you like us to take this embarrassment from you? Uh, we will take the Ontario Hydro uh, property as a gift. Uh, there's an on the waterfront article about this. If you will tear down those stacks that are full of asbestos so we don't have to deal with them. And they have created a, uh, a, a, an all solar electric farm there. 
Dr. Free, you mentioned a, a good and bad thing when Brant takes 2,000 Iroquois family uh, and, and, and heads to Canada. What's the impact on the population? Uh, what does that look like? How, how much of the population then is he moving out of the region? Well, by the time that he left, the population was devastated by Euro European contact and also by the wars. Uh, the Beaver Wars had an impact on, on the Iroquois because you know, people fought against them. Uh, lots of this, the other tribes hated them and they fought them. And uh, the, way the, uh, the, the way the Eries disappeared was the, the, they were attacked uh, unsuccessfully. So at the first part by the Iroquois, so they lost a lot of people. The good thing that you could say that he did was to take a couple of thousand people and put them in one place and give them something to do because Brantford has been a very successful economic uh, development for the Iroquois over there. And, and you had mentioned, and we see him on our screen now, a, a picture of Chief Joseph Brandt. Uh, you had mentioned uh, about the original sin. Um, uh, recap that quickly for us. Well, Han Handsome Lake uh, characterized Brandt's organization of the warriors, as opposed to the stays by the forts chiefs. That's, that's terminology that got into the Dances with Wolves movie that was actually Eastern, came from Graham Greene actually. Uh, and by the way, all the language, this is a criticism of dances with world wolves, all the language, the, the Native American language, and that is all Iroquoian. Uh, but that's, that's another tangent for another story. When Handsome Lake showed up uh, to, you know, tip his finger and say, you guys screwed up, and that's why you've been devastated here, you Native Americans, you Iroquois that stayed on the American side of the Great Lakes, you don't have much going for you anymore because you fell into this original sin. And uh, as Indians were being relocated to Oklahoma, he was trying to help them to understand uh, how to take the high road spiritually. A couple of different sources that we draw from. Walk us through where you're finding your information, where folks who are interested in, in diving beyond this, uh, where they can tune in. Uh, and, and as we near um, uh, the ending here, I, we, we've got some questions in the comment section. I appreciate those. We're going to save some time to get to those. If you do have questions, do leave them in the comment section of this Facebook Live post. Uh, and we'll do our best to work our way through. Uh, but Dr. Fru, tell us where we go for this information, how we get this. Because if we remember from earlier in the presentation, you talk about the oral tradition of the tribes, keeping their stories through storytelling, and, and those being uh, bestowed upon uh, the elder women in the tribes. How do we finally start to begin to capture the information and sources for all of this? Well, I'll do this in, in the wrong order. The Swedish uh, talked to the Susquehannock as they were working with them uh, to harvest beaver. The Hus Susquehanna wanted a few guns and a lot of bullets, as opposed to the Iroquois, who wanted all the guns they could get, but often they had guns and no ammunition. So the Swedish spent time to try to understand the Susquehannock, and the Susquehannock told uh, uh, the Swedish about the Eries, and uh, they helped the Swedish to understand that there was a cosmology and a tradition here in stories, uh, but that most of the Europeans were missing it. The Jesuits, of course, uh, were really fascinated uh, when they encountered uh, the Native Americans, and particularly the Iroquois and the Huron, and they were constantly writing newsletters. Those are uh, findable, and, and they're, they're organized into books. So the Jesuit newsletters can be read. They're translated into English, and I, I wouldn't know, but I'm guessing that they're translated properly. There was one uh, European who was sent here by the Governor General of New France from Montreal to try to come to the northern side of the Great Lakes. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the people in Montreal knew lots about the northern side, I might have just said that wrong, part of the Great Lakes, part that's now Upper Canada, Ontario, but they knew little about what was going on on the southern side. So they sent a frontiersman, a fellow that was linguistically skillful enough to talk to the Indians, Etienne Brule, uh, over to this side to learn. Etienne Brule encountered Erie's Indians at Niagara Falls during trading. Uh, they were there trading their fish for venison and for uh, arrowheads, as was going on there every year at the trading time. And uh, he wrote back how big they were, how intimidating they were to the other Indians and how the other Indians didn't like them. And of course, 
some of the best information lives at the Iroquois Six Nations at Brantford, where there are uh, now people who are, pe they, there's people with master's degrees and PhDs who are native Iroquoian uh, who have dedicated their lives to trying to understand how all this works and to doing research. And you mentioned, you know, Brantford being such a, a, a great place to go and, and, and find research. And, and you mentioned the relations newsletters by the Jesuits, uh, something that you've looked at and other people can access. Here on the screen, we have a picture of, of Etienne Brule, who you just mentioned. Um, uh, give us a little bit of context here, because what we see is we see um, a portrait of Brule with Native Americans and we see a memorial in Toronto. Yeah, that's there's a there's a, a plaque and a memorial to him in Toronto. If you were, if you were a Canadian, especially in the Toronto area, uh, you wouldn't be uh, shocked when I say there was a fellow by the name of Etienne Brule, uh, who was a powerfully important uh, frontiersman and a person that made the time in it to get to know the the Indians. I would guess he would be kind of like that crazy revenant character uh, that was played uh, in in the scary movie by the same name. Far as we know, he's the only uh, European person that came in direct contact with the Eries. Sadly, he didn't write, he, he spoke. And uh, he passed his information about the uh, Eries along to others who wrote. But of course, what's written about the Eries Indians is not secondhand, thirdhand. So a, uh, a, a historian with a research orientation would be a little troubled by that. But it's still, it gives us something and we have something. And I, I think an important takeaway here is trying to capture the history as we can. Uh, we see uh, the tribes themselves not recording the history and the Europeans not working to record any of that history or preserve it. And, and here we see one of the only contacts also known to be a storyteller uh, and, and not necessarily a documentarian or someone who's recording that. This is the $64,000 question. And we've got some questions in the comment section uh, asking, where did the Eries go? Uh, so Dr. Dr. this is what we've been building to. Uh, what happened to the Erie's Indians? Well, the, uh, the Iroquois started picking them off one tribe at a time. They were trying to clear the decks so that they would have a monopoly on the beaver. They weren't particularly trusting of the tribes that said, gee, we can't find any more beaver because we killed them all. So they decided to come with their guns and kill them themselves. And other tribes were in their way. So they ended up at war with loads of tribes, including the Huron. Uh, they began to see the Eries as a huge threat, and since the Eries were spread out, they lived in lots of villages along Lake Erie, they were picking them off one stockaded village at a time. And uh, at some point, 1663, 1665, uh, we're not sure, somewhere in the middle 1600s, uh, they sort of decided it was time that they couldn't defend themselves anymore and they disappeared. They were probably not going uh, to merge with the Iroquois, although the Iroquois were famous because they were desperate for more people, uh, for grabbing up the the, the people that the, the people that they uh, that they uh, that, that they conquered, and absorbing or absorbing them into Iroquois tribes. Uh, we know that some went to the Susquehannock because the Susquehan Sus Susquehannock, also called the Conestoga Indians. They carried on for years and years after this. Uh, they were too far away for the Iroquois to uh, effectively get rid of. But they were stretched into Ohio when we suspect that they uh, probably merged with some of the Ohio Indian tribes and the Huron uh, tell us that some of them went that way and, and merged with the Huron uh, tribes as well on the other side of the lake. So, Dr. Fru, on, on the slide here, we have an image. What are we looking at? That's the Mohawk Chapel at the Six Nations Reservation in Brantford, Ontario. A beautiful place. And uh, one of the questions of the Eries, and I'm sure you get this one often, uh, someone's asking, what does the name mean? What does it translate into? Uh, is it a uh, cat? We, we've heard that before. Um, what does your research show? Be uh, a raccoon. A cat, a cat like animal that's, uh, you know, quiet and docile unless you disturb it, and then it will turn on you and get nasty and vicious. And loads of the names for tribes uh, came from Europeans. So the Iroquois have never called themselves the Iroquois. They do now because it's comfortable for them and easier. Uh, but they called themselves the people of the longhouse. Uh, 
Iroquois was rattlesnake people of, and that's a name that was given uh, to the Iroquois by the Algonquins and then uh, Frenchized by the French. Qua is a French ending meaning people of, people of the rattlesnake. And, and Dr. Fru, one of the questions from the audience uh, is asking about the composition in Erie County. As we see the Eries disappear, uh, you're noting about 1665. What does the composition of, of tribes look like in Erie County after that? Well, I, I just got this question a couple of days ago from, from a friend uh, who's working uh, on a plaque in Edinburgh. Maybe he's the guy that's asking that question. The short answer is, I don't know. Uh, what Indians would have been here? Uh, after things got really bad for the Seneca, uh, we know where the Seneca are. They're kind of, they, the Seneca had, they were moved to Oklahoma. Then there was a, there was a lawsuit, a vigorous lawsuit uh, that they won, and they got back enough of their land uh, to be able to establish, and I, I hate this is an awful way to think about Native Americans, the casino uh, that's uh, somewhere near uh, Bradford, not Bradford, it's on I-17 near, I'll think of the town in a second, and also the Seneca Casino in Niagara Falls. So there are big pockets of Seneca there. But when they were being told they had to move and walk to Oklahoma, lots of them thought, oh, gee, we're not going to do that. And they just they just disappeared like the Erie's did. And I'm guessing that maybe some of the, the, the Indian tribes uh, that populated Pennsylvania came from them and others might have come from Ohio. And loads of uh, what we know about Indians and the Indian dig sites that we've been looking at in the last uh, 30 or 40 years, those are relatively new and modern sites that came from, there was a Seneca group that came here and tried to do farming and fishing at, uh, at the Summerheim area uh, overlooking Presque Isle Bay. And there were some Indians that came here to fight against us uh, from Ohio. Uh, part of the uh, sort of conglomerate group that came uh, that, uh, that Mad Anthony Wayne fought against, uh, they may have uh, taken root here. So someone asked me who the Indians would have been that were somewhere near uh, Edinburgh Lake. I don't know the answer. I'm just going to guess it was either Seneca's or some people from Ohio. And when I asked that person questions like, are you sure there were Indians around Edinburgh Lake? I, I didn't know that. He said, like, yeah, everybody that had a farm was plowing up arrowheads and pottery pieces when they were working their farm. And uh, Dr. Fru, were you thinking of Salamanca Casino? That's exactly uh, what I was thinking. Salamanca, Salamanca. Yes, sir. That's it. We, we want to thank the uh, the audience there in the comment sections for weighing in on that. Uh, one other question here from, from the audience. Um, uh, this person's act, asking, Dr. Fru, if you have an opinion on Wallum Olam. Uh, I, I will admittedly say I'm unfamiliar with this. It's W-A-L-L-A-M, uh, new word, O L. AM, uh, and they're saying the so-called red record. Uh, is it authentic or European invention to justify the lost tribe of Israel myth? No, I thought they went to uh, upstate New York. The lost tribes of Israel, I'm confused. I thought they were, they were, they became the Mormons and they, they started out at Palmyra, New York, but you know, no, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm unfamiliar with that as well. Well, it gives us something to look into uh, for the next time we gather. But Dr. Fru, I, I, I can't help but think that as you've been working on, uh, as you were working on, and, and you continue your research, uh, but as you were working on Accidental Paradise, uh, that 13,000 year history of Presque Isle, um, you had to have encountered uh, questions commonly or often being asked, uh, what people were most curious about during your research. Uh, did you see certain questions arising from person to person that they were curious about when it comes to the native populations uh, in, in our area when you were researching? Well, two sets of questions that were the most common, and those came up before I started working on this. Are we still good? We're still good. Uh, okay. Uh, one set of questions were, how many people were really, really buried in Graveyard Pond on Presque Isle? Uh, we know that that's all full of dead bodies. Uh, people got uh, uh, lake fever, and we we've tricked them into a hold holding a cannonball, and we chipped a hole in the ice and dropped them underwater and let them drown there. Uh, of course, totally false. And the second most common set of questions that would come uh, would be, uh, did Indians live on Presque Isle? And the quick answer to that is no. 
the, the Indians on both sides of the lake were sort of scared to death of the lake. They saw what it could do. They didn't use it as a transport uh, method. They thought the Europeans were nuts when they saw them paddling across the lake in bateau and towing rafts and stuff with horses on them. They just couldn't imagine that anybody could be that dumb because they could see what that lake could do. They uh, lived within range of the lake, uh, not as far south as Edinburgh, uh, but they used the lake for fishing episodically. And that's what you had mentioned. Uh, they were actually afraid of the water. Uh, they weren't always on the water. Um, I love the story about the canoes and, and, and people asking about that because I think that shows sometimes how we uh, paint with a very broad brush, uh, natives in the tribes. And, and going back to one of our original points of just how diverse uh, the cultures were um, throughout the country. Uh, Dr. Fru, we are out of time for this, but I know we're coming back for more. I want to echo some of the comments in the comment section. Good presentation and recommend Accidental Paradise. I do too. More information can be found at accidentalparadise.com. Uh, one person says, fascinating. I agree, Dr. Fru. They're thanking you so much. Another one uh, thanks you for this wonderful history lesson. So Dr. David Fruit, JES scholar in residence, author of uh, the On the Waterfront series and co-author of Accidental Paradise, a 13,000 year history of Presque Isle. Thank you for sharing your knowledge and expertise and taking the time, energy and effort to join us here in conversation. Thank you for coming. And uh, for more information on how, where, and when to purchase Accidental Paradise, the 13,000 year history on Presque Isle, please do visit uh, the Trek, uh, Trek Foundation's Tom Ridge Environmental Center Foundation's website uh, for the book, which is accidentalparadise.com. And uh, big thanks to all of you watching along at home. Thank you for your comments. Thank you for your questions. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, friendly reminder to stream other JES digital programs uh, on demand, head over to jesery.org. There you're gonna find uh, details about upcoming programs as well as a wide range of publications from quick timely reads like Dr. David Frew's On the Waterfront series to reports, essays, and more, uh, all available for free to download. And be sure to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. For the Jefferson Educational Society, I'm Ben Spagan. Be safe, be sound, and thanks for listening and learning with us.